There we go. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Oshin Odrisko. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Arigna Soviet, a very interesting event that happened 100 years ago, basically this summer in Leitrim. We have quite a bit to get through, but I will do my best not to delay anyone's lunch. We'll try and get through it as quickly as we can. So to introduce the subject briefly, the Arigna Soviet was essentially a radical industrial action that occurred in the summer of 1921, when the workers at the Arigna mines in, you know, on the border between Leitrim and Roscommon, having been locked out of their workplace as part of a dispute over a pay decrease, basically refused to be locked out, as you can see written on this contemporary article here. They broke into the mine, they occupied one of the pits, and they successfully worked it themselves, running it as a workers' cooperative for pretty much the entirety of the summer. Uh, it's a really interesting action um, that I think uh, is often been overlooked in the history of this period in Leitrim. Now, while the action, as I said, was the result of a very specific pay dispute, which had begun in March of that year, there was a long legacy of ill feeling and tensions towards the mining company and its largely aristocratic owners, which included members of the Clements family, of course, who once lived here. Much of this Ill, Ill feeling could be traced back to the mining company's quite unusual relationship with its so-called Siamese twin, the Cavan and Leitrim Railway Company, and I'll discuss that in some detail later. Now, the specific inciting incident in this dispute, however, related to a decision taken in London to essentially reprivatize all the coal mines in Ireland and Britain, which had been effectively nationalized during the First World War. As is so all over Ireland and Britain, this reprivatization came with major pay decreases for miners, it led to a huge industrial dispute. Uh, there were massive strikes all over Britain. Quite famously, the miners uh, during this dispute were abandoned by their allies in the labor movement, specifically in the railway and dockers unions in an event known as Black Friday, which I'll discuss in a little bit of detail later. So while the British miners were widely locked out and eventually defeated, in Ireland, or at least in Arigla, the story went very differently. In Arigna, they refused to be locked out and were eventually able to negotiate major concessions from the company before eventually surrendering control back to the company. Though the whole situation was complicated by the outbreak of the Civil War, which of course, uh, you know, there was a lot of activity in Arigna at the time. As I said, I'll discuss that in some detail as we go on. Uh, this action must also be understood in the context of other workers' Soviets that occurred in Ireland during this period. Well, many have now heard of the Limerick Soviet, which was quite explicitly concerned with nationalist politics and resistance to the British Army. Many other Soviets occurred in workplaces around the country that were more, we could say, class-based or class struggle-based in character, including, for example, the Nochlan Creamery Soviet, the Monaghan Asylum Soviet, and a Soviet at another coal mine in Balnagari in Tipperary. While we might broadly say that certain Soviets and strikes were concerned with the struggle for national self-determination and others, like Arigna, were more focused on labour issues, I will seek to show that this distinction is more complicated than it may appear, and that on a very basic level, the Soviets that occurred in Ireland would not have been conceivable or even possible had it not been for the state of war that the country was in at the time. So this is just my contents quickly, because as you see, I'm going to quite quickly try and go through the history of coal mining the Arigna Valley to try and identify certain historical trends that I think have an impact on the Soviet. Then I'm going to talk about the Cavan and Leitrim Railway Company and its Siamese twin, the mining company. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the First World War and the sort of history of state control by the British government over coal mines. And then finally, we will come to the Arigna Soviet. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the problems of evidence related to this topic then the story of the Soviet, and then we'll have a conclusion. So just to very briefly try and go through some of the history of coal mining in the Arigna Valley. So while the presence of coal, by, uh, coal and iron deposits in or around this area has been attested for centuries, the modern history of mining in the area begins in 1784, when Thomas Tennyson, the, basically the occupant of what's now Kilronan Castle, who had rights over the mining in the area, leased the rights to a woman called Mrs. Mary O'Reilly, who was a wealthy Dublin widow. Her son set about trying to raise money to open up the mines. Now, at this point, it's worth noting that they were very much interested in the iron, not the coal. That was the focus. I mean, this is pre-industrial revolution. Coal basically isn't that important. So at this point, the focus was on extracting the iron and then using local timber, local forests, to fuel iron smelting. There was an iron... There was an iron foundry in or around the Drumshambo area. 
Now, the O'Reillys uh, did not really have much luck. Um, they had problems with fuel sources. They had basically borrowed loads and loads of money to set it up, and they were forced to declare bankruptcy in 1793. The mine was then taken over by this man, Peter Latouche. So the Latouches were a famous banking family in Dublin. Peter Latouche took it over. However, he didn't have it for long because in 1795, one of the O'Reillys, Thomas O'Reilly, who was a United Irishman, returned with a group of Catholic defenders and occupied the mine, apparently with the intention of manufacturing pikes for the war effort. Latouche eventually did get control back, but in the end, he was forced to abandon it as well in around 1808, having lost a huge amount of money. So we can see just an early example there of the way that conflict shaped the development of the extraction of the mineral resources in and around this area. So moving on, we have the story of Roger Flattery. So in 1824, Roger Flattery, a somewhat mercurial figure, but he was believed to be an architect from Dublin, raised capital in England to reopen the mines. Now, from the beginning, the financial arrangements around this story were very murky. A huge amount of money had been raised, but right from the beginning, there were accusations of fraud. It all broke down eventually into lawsuits, and before the company had even lifted a stone in Roscommon, the entire board had quit and had to be replaced. It was eventually the subject of a select committee in the British House of Commons. This was because several MPs had invested. Nonetheless, eventually, Flattery did manage to get down onto the ground and begin digging. At this point, he was still focused on extracting iron. Flattery employed a number of experienced managers, all of whom were British, and very quickly, tensions began to emerge between the often paternalistic, let's say, foreign supervisors and the workers. And this is a theme that, again, will reappear as we go on. On the night of the 23rd of February, 1828, three miners forced their way into the mine office and secured weapons which they then took the ho to the home of a mine manager, an English man called Captain Thomas Cox, who they shot dead before basically uh, ransacking his house. There are lots of different theories about what this was over, whether it was a personal dispute, whether they were just looking to rob him. There's also a theory that they may have thought he was a different Thomas Cox who had been involved in a legal case involving Daniel O'Connell. Whatever was going on, we don't really know exactly, but it is an example of so uh, another way that conflict and local kind of, we might say, political tensions shaped the development of the history of the mine. The, key, the killing became something of a cause célèbre across Britain and Ireland, probably hastened the demise of the company, which basically became defunct in around 1831, although flattery stuck around in the area, continuing to try to run the mines. Starting in 1841, a new consortium headed by a guy called Robert White formed with the intention of trying to take the mines from Flattery and open them up and develop them further. Now, this dispute also, again, another theme, escalated rapidly to the point of violence. Uh, in one incident, one of Flattery's sons allegedly attacked White with a hatchet. Flattery was accused of having allowed the mines to fall into a state of general disrepair and have mismanaged them. At this point, when you read it, Flattery has kind of a Captain Kurtz sort of vibe to him. If you've ever seen Apocalypse Now, he seems to have gone a bit um, wild, let's say, in his time there. Eventually, White did manage to wrestle control, but it didn't do him any good, and he, in turn, declared bankruptcy in the 1850s. We can see a theme sort of repeating here, where while many people identify a great potential in the iron and coal deposits, and there's all these talks of big plans, pretty much every attempt to actually realize that potential ends in disaster for one reason or another. And we can see the way that both conflict, political conflict, military conflict, and also political tensions and, so as you could say, Anglo-Irish tensions, if you want to talk about the story of Thomas Cox, um, complicate and in some ways sabotage that, uh, the realization of that development. So moving along to the next attempt, we have to start with the Cavan and Leitrim Railway Company. So the Cavan, Leitrim and Roscommon Light Railway Company was established in 1883 with Lord Kingston. So this is the descendant of Thomas Tennyson, who had the mining rights going way back into the 17th century as its director. Now, you might notice the name. Roscommon dropped out before the railways were actually built, but they was originally going to have some in Roscommon as well. So their goal was to establish a light railway company between Cavan and Leitrim. For this, they raised 300,000 uh, pounds, mostly in England, from investors. 
And they had a very favorable deal with the local government. So basically, the initial investment was guaranteed by the local ratepayers. In practice, this essentially meant that if the company failed to make a profit, the local rates and the local ratepayers would cover the dividends owed to the shareholders at no cost to the company. For this reason, it was vital for the company to win public support, and a major publicity campaign was mounted. Local people were assured that the company would soon turn a profit once it was up and running, and that as a result, the burden on the ratepayers would decrease and eventually be lifted. The campaign surrounding this heavily referenced the local coal deposits as a way that they would be able to have a local affordable fuel source for the mines. These assurances would come back to bite the company later on. Now, as part of this deal, the local grand juries, which is the precursor to the county councils, were given the right to appoint the majority of the board's members. While this might sound strange to us, why would a company agree to that? It is worth understanding that the grand juries, even though they preceded the county councils and they were essentially the local government, they weren't the same as a local council. For one thing, they were not actually elected. It was more like, uh, like jury duty. You were summoned you were on to serve on a grand jury. And in practice, uh, who would end up on the grand juries was dominated by the local gentry and aristocracy. So really, the grand juries, though technically they're the local government, they're dominated by the exact same people who are already running the railway company. So it was not really a big sacrifice on their part to uh, allow the grand juries to be involved in the running. The building of the railways was not without issues, including a short strike and a tragic accident in which three workers were killed. Nonetheless, the railway opened in October of 1887. Now, despite above expected demand, the railway ran at a significant loss in its first year. So in 1888, it restructured. And as part of this, the Arigna Mining Company was created. So this was based on Lord Kingston's, uh, the so-called Tennyson rights to the Arigna Valley coal deposits. Described as the Siamese twin of the Cavan and Leitrim Railway, the mining company was officially a separate entity with its own offices and board, but in practice, this board was largely populated by the directors of the railway company, and in reality, they functioned as if they were one company for the majority of their existence. The company struggled, the mining company this is, struggled with high overheads and labor issues. There were a couple of strikes at the mine early on. And at one point, the entire operation was offered to a creditor to pay a debt of 83 pounds. To try and turn thing ar things around, in 1890, the Cavan and Leitrim Railway Company's traffic manager, Mr. William Henry McAdoo, offered to serve as the mining company's secretary for no extra salary a tough and dedicated Monaghan man, described as capable and mostly respected by his men, McAdoo was to play a major role in the history of both companies. While the railway continued to struggle, McAdoo began to succeed with the mines. He became popular with the miners and railway workers by, by securing them discounted coal from the mines for their homes, and by organizing an annual trip on the railways for the miners and their families. Once a year, they would be brought down to Mohill for dinner. Relations with the more senior management remained tense, however, and the railway workers are first known to have formally unionized in 1894. Also around this time, in 1892, Reverend Joseph Garvin Diggs joined the board of the railway company. Many of course have heard of him. He's the famous, who was the cleric to the Clement family here in Loch Rin, and he's more famously known as the father of Irish beekeeping. He's a really interesting character, and he was one of the biggest personalities on the board. He later served as the director of the company. Uh, we have a picture here of Mr. William Henry McAdoo here in a nice white suit. And this is a few other members of the board. Uh, the guy with the cane, if you notice, second from the left, that is Colonel H.T. Clements. So not actually the Lord Leitrim of that era, but another uh, member of the Clements family who was involved in the company. So over time, tensions continue to build between the local people and the CNL. So one of the big incidents that led to our increase in tensions was in 1898. In 1898, a local government act was passed that abolished the grand juries and set up for the first time directly elected local councils, local authorities. Now, the company basically didn't want to have the elected, local directly elected council to have a majority on their board. So they reconstituted their board, they added a bunch of new seats, and they essentially robbed the councils of the majority on the board that had been given to the grand juries. 
this absolutely inflamed local opinion as it was quite reasonably interpreted as a slight against the elected represent representatives of the local people and in general as elitist, undemocratic and not in keeping with the spirit of the terms on which the company had been established even if the company had not broke the actual letter of the rules, let's say. <coughs> What's more, the railway company continued to struggle to break even which left local people responsible for covering the dividends owed to the shareholders. Over time, the burden on the local ratepayers was actually going up rather than down, as had been promised. People also began to become suspicious of their relationship with the mining company. Mr. McAdoo had successfully brought down costs and increased output, and by this point, the mines were reportedly turning a steady profit, mostly selling coal to the railway company as well as to local people. People were dissatisfied that the railway company got its coal cheaper than they did, for one thing. But beyond this, Many were suspicious that the owners of both companies, which were the same people, were happy to let the railway run at a loss, knowing that they were covered by the local taxpayers, while pocketing a tidy profit from the mine, which was only able to make a profit by selling coal to the railway company. So it's a bit, you know, it's hard to see how they would actually be benefiting by the railway company not doing well, but you can understand how people thought there was something a bit dodgy about this relationship in general. In 1906, a vice regal commission on Irish railways heard a lot of these complaints, and while it didn't find that there was anything strictly improper about the relationships, it did uphold several complaints, including allegations that the company had sectarian or unfair hiring practices related to um, who they particularly hired into management positions. This has to be added as well to the general local hostility towards many of the company's owners, including, let's say, the Clemens family, the Kingston family, and so on. And as I said, there was also allegations that the company illustrated a marked preference for hiring mostly uh, Northern Ulster Protestants uh, or members of the local Protestant community into management positions. And though individuals on their own, like Mr. McAdoo, might have been well liked, others, and especially people from more further up in the north, were resented and were in many cases less popular. So, In 1904, in 1905, uh, a plan was formed to extend the line to the mine entrance uh, of the Arigna mine. So local hostility to the company had fueled opposition to any attempt to extend the existing lines, and this was a huge problem for the mining company. As it stood, the line ended in the Arigna Valley, in the Arigna village, forcing the miners to cart the coal three and a half miles down the hill which was claimed added as much as two shillings per tonne to the cost of coal. And at this time, that cost was a roughly about 14 shillings per tonne. So you can see that's a pretty significant amount to be adding. Many, including Reverend Diggs, felt that this, as well as the general lack of local transport infrastructure, was largely responsible for locking the mines out of national and international markets, and thus making it impossible for the operation to expand as it otherwise might have liked it. In 1905, a plan was formed to extend the line to the mine entrance, and this was to be funded by a £24,000 grant straight from London. While it was hailed in the national press as a great boon for an underdeveloped area, locally, many were suspicious. Many disliked the idea of a large state grant being used to essentially benefit a private mining company, and questioned whether the money could not be better employed elsewhere. Whatever the exact reason for people's feelings, in February of 1906, a crowd of men armed with black storm, blackthorn sticks stormed a county council meeting in Carrigan Shannon in a famous uh, controversy, instigating a minor riot that eventually led the council to cancel the project and return the grant money to London, which itself became a press sensation in Ireland and in, in fact in Britain because people were basically shocked. Why is a county council handing back money to the government? That seems pretty strange. In the context, however, of local feelings towards both the owners of the mine and the railway, it is, if unfortunate, comprehensible, I think, that people felt this way. People basically didn't want to see anything done that would benefit the railway company or the mining company. This event prompted, prompted the MP Patrick McHugh, who was then the MP for North Leitrim, to comment with a quote that I really like. The suggestion that a body of Leitrim men would, under any circumstances, be awed by the presence of the police is delightful in its simplicity. <laughs> and I like to think that still holds true today. <laughs> so to conclude part one, so we can see recurring themes throughout the history of the mines. 
There is believed, mostly by the investors, to be great potential, but various factors stand in the way of realising that potential. To put it another way, you could also say that excuses are constantly found for the failure of enterprise after enterprise. Now, these factors include the high freight costs, underdevelopment of the area. Uh, the, for example, I mean, it was so expensive to move coal out of the area that Sligo, only, Sligo towns, Sligo like Corporation, were routinely importing coal from Scotland rather than from Leitrim because it was cheaper to ship it over from Scotland than move it up from Leitrim. And this lasted up until the First World War. So there was also a lack of local capital and there was difficulties in accessing foreign capital. Investors from England needed special assurances on the part of local authorities, so what I said about the ratepayers, in order to invest their money in Ireland. We then have the problem of what might broadly be called political tensions, though they were also, of course, class and what might, again, broadly be called ethno-religious tensions or religious tensions. Reverend Diggs referred to this in a pamphlet as a spirit of intolerance that he felt was endemic. That was his perspective. But in the interest of fairness, it must be said that people did have legitimate grievances against the owners of the company and against the company's hiring practices and the clear contempt that had been shown towards the county council um, with the restructuring of the board. In general, we can say with certainty that heading into the First World War, there was a severe lack of both trust and goodwill between the two companies and the people of the area, and this was to have an impact on events to follow. So just talk a little bit to zoom out a bit and talk more about coal mining in a broader perspective relating to the First World War. So prior to the First World War, British coal production and export had risen exponentially for decades, from under 70 million tonnes in 1850 to nearly 300 million tonnes by 1913. By 1914, Britain was by far the dominant coal exporting country in the world, exporting coal to industrializing countries all across the world, as well as to its European neighbours. The sheer scale of the British coal mining industry, which by 1913 employed nearly 900,000 men underground, and its export power relative to that, should be kept in mind when discussing the inability of small Irish mines like Arigna to compete even within the Irish domestic market. You know, you've got this huge coal behemoth exporting to you right next to you, basically. The outbreak of war immediately and severely curtailed the ability of the UK to export coal. The German coal market, to take one example, had accounted for nearly 20% of British coal exports before the war, and that obviously disappeared overnight. The industry was also hit heavily by recruitment into the army, with nearly 20% of miners having enlisted in the British army by March of 1915. This spelled disaster for the industry. And if the coal supply could not be secured, from the British government's perspective, the war effort was basically doomed. By early 1915, the war effort was beginning to compensate for the loss of export markets by driving demand. However, with the manpower shortage, new fears emerged that demand would soon outstrip supply. Now, coal prices were beginning to rise, and heading into winter, this was seen to be a pretty big problem. So in the summer of 1915, the new coalition government in London rapidly passed a series of acts to secure the supply. The Munitions Act of 1951 banned strikes and made it illegal for workers in key industries, including the mines, railways, and munitions industries, to leave their jobs. It was literally illegal to quit your job, even if you were joining the army. By way of compensation, however, it established new systems of official oversight, which included representatives of the unions, really, for the first time. So this is one of the first steps towards nationalisation. The threat of strikes in several coal fields in South Wales led Lloyd George's government to nationalise several mines there in 1915, and the following year, the decision was made to extend state control to the entire industry. And this was partly because Lord George, ever the pragmatist, needed to secure the support of the Labour Party in the British House of Commons, and this was a measure that they had been pushing for. So under state control, which was essentially nationalisation, if not exactly nationalisation, miners received pay rises, and for the first time, a national minimum wage. So no matter where you were working, you had a set wage. Miners' representatives were included in a new system of administering the mines at the national level through the Board of Trade, and for the most part, they supported nationalisation. Mine owners were also well compensated, such as the Arigna Mining Company, being paid for their coal at a rate fixed to their 1913 profits. Remember that prices had peaked in 1913, so that was a very favourable deal from their perspective. Now, this has been referred to as a form of war socialism, 
Uh, and as one of many ways in which the war forced the liberals to essentially abandon economic liberalism for pragmatic reasons. Many other key industries were de facto nationalized, including railways. So the Cavern Leitrim Railway Company was also taken under state control, and as I said, the munitions industry. During this period, smaller mines like Arigna benefited from profit pooling. So profits from larger mines were made available to smaller mines. The railway extension, for example, to the mouth of the mine was, extend, was rapidly completed and the miners enjoyed increased wages. However, it was not to last. The Restoration of Pre-War Practices Act, very literally named, in 1919 sought to reverse many of the measures that had been taken during the war. Now, its main effect was to essentially ban women from most workplaces. That was one of its major things it did. However, on the subject of denationalization of the mines, the government basically stayed their hand because they feared that a general strike by the so-called triple alliance of miners, railway workers, and dockers would lead to the collapse of the government. Now, given contemporary events in Russia, Germany, and of course in Ireland at that time, they did have good reason to believe that there was a risk of a general revolution. Now, the miners pretty una unanimously wanted mines to be permanently nationalized. However, the mine owners obviously were against this. The London government was afraid to act quickly, but it wanted to be seen to do something, so they set up a commission in 1919 to investigate how the running of the mines by the state had gone. That commission actually reported that it had been pretty much a non-mitigated success and recommended that the mines be taken into permanent state control. However, this was not likely to happen. Now, when we talk about the fear of strikes, it's important to put this in context of the major unsettled state of labor in Britain and Ireland at this time. During 19 to 1920, on average, over two million workers were involved in strikes in Ireland and Britain at any given time. Miners in Britain went on strike for a period in 1920, causing major coal shortages. During this period, Arigna, the Arigna mines, however, continued to operate. This was most likely because the miners were not actually part of the major British mining union, the CMFGB. They were part of the ITGWU, like most organized workers. Uh, reports in local papers in October of 1920, in fact, stated that Arigna was unable to meet local demand from customers and the railway company, forcing the CNL to curtail rail services. Now, by 1920, the cost of coal was plummeting, and Britain was struggling in the export markets. By early 1921, the government was set on ending state control and of the mines and returning them to their owners. With the economy in free fall, this would mean major pay cuts for miners pretty much everywhere. In some cases, miners in remote areas were reportedly facing pay cuts of up to 50% of their wartime wages. The date for reprivatization was set for the 31st of March. The miners obviously intended to strike and sought the support of their allies. But on the 15th of April 1921, the dockers and railway workers unions voted against a sympathetic strike in an event that came to be known as Black Friday. So not the famous American shopping day since. Um, although dockers came out anyway in some areas, the miners were essentially abandoned. Locked out in many cases, they attempted to continue their strikes for several months, but were eventually roundly defeated all over England, Scotland and Wales. So this brings us now, at last, to the actual story of the Arigna Soviet. First, I want to talk a little bit briefly about some of the problems of evidence relating to this subject. So in general, I think it's fair to say that the phenomena of Irish Soviets during the revolutionary period is understudied and underdocumented compared to contemporary events of a more explicitly nationalistic character. Between the Monaghan Asylum Soviet in 1919 and the Waterford Gas Works dispute in 1923, Dozens of individual Soviets and workplace occupations occurred all over the country in industries of all kinds. Now, since that time, while there has been a huge amount of interest in recording the stories of those engaged in the national struggle and commemorating significant events relating to individuals associated with Sinn Féin and the IRA, uh, comparatively, the history of the radical labor movement and of the Soviets more particularly has been somewhat forgotten. For many within the nationalist movement, the flying of the red flag by Irish workers was later seen to be an embarrassment, if not an actual threat, to the social order. On another level, we must also remember that participants in the most radical strikes in Soviets were often from the lowest rungs on the social ladder, and these are people whose life stories typically fail their to find their way into archives. And this includes unskilled workers, coal miners, farm laborers, and in the case of the Monaghan Asylum Soviet, 
the mentally ill who joined the staff in helping to run the hospital. Even in terms of local memory in 20th, 20th century Ireland, these, the poorest and most marginalised workers, emigrated in huge numbers, often taking their social memories of events like strikes and Soviets with them. Figures of the radical left were also marginalised in other ways by their status as outsiders in the new independent Ireland. One pertinent example is that of Geoffrey Coulter, who we see fo photographed here. The famous so-called Protestant Bolshevik from Tyrone was a Republican socialist, and he has widely been described as the leader of the Arigna Soviet in literature. And while there is nothing to disprove this, there is frustratingly little that can be said for certain about Coulter's life and his connection with Arigna. Pension applications of his anti-treaty comrades, he was in the anti-treaty IRA, indicate that he was in the area, certainly, in 1922 at least, but Coulter himself does not appear to have filed an application, making it difficult to trace him. This is, in truth, unsurprising when we remember that during the late 1920s and early 30s, Coulter was not only still a communist activist, but was an active member of the IRA and at one point the editor of Un Foblacht. Even as most anti-treaty fighters were symbolically rehabilitated and reconciled to the state by Fianna Fáil's election victory, culture and his ilk remained outside the fold and in direct opposition to the establishment. Therefore, their stories remain outside the archives and go unrecorded. It is also worth mentioning that in the particular case of Arigna, research is badly hampered by the fire which in the 1990s destroyed the archives of the Arigna Mining Company. <laughs> Other archives, of course, are, have been closed for the past year due to the pandemic, but you know, that's sort of a problem for everyone, I suppose. In the end, we are left largely reliant on the available newspaper reports, as well as discussions of events at the 1921 Labour Conference and a report released by the Arigna Mining Company publicly in 1922. Hopefully, the truth can be found somewhere between these different sources. So here is the actual narrative to the Soviet. We get there at last. I have some water because there's a lot of talking. So around March 15th of 1921, the company, the Arigna Mining Company, announced pay cuts of 10% that were to take effect once they had control of the mines again. In other words, they were announcing that this, would, the, this return to their control would bring an end to the rates of pay set by the industrial board. The miners refused to accept this pay cut. It appears that there was a truce of some time, of so, for some time that was reached until in mid-April a further attempt was made by the company to bring in pay cuts. The miners refused to accept this and were locked out. The mine closed down. Sometime around the 4th of May, between the 1st and the 4th of May, I believe, the, miter, the miners held a meeting at which they elected a leadership from amongst them and then marched down to the mine, breaking in and occupying it, beginning then to bring up coal from pit number one and selling it themselves on the local market. And we know that the company sent out a letter on the 12th of May to the miners, but the workers refused to surrender and directed to send them to send further communications to their union. It is clear that there was a severe lack of trust between the two sides. It may be relevant to note by this, that by this point, the at times controversial but largely popular Mr. McAdoo had left the company. Here we can see photographed a notice that was posted around the area informing locals that the pit had been occupied and that anyone who purchased coal at this time would face prosecution. I have a larger version of this as well. So you can actually... You can hopefully just about read it. The notice is dated to the 12th of May, and this particular cop copy is from the uh, papers of Mr. William O'Brien, who was then the leader of the Labour Party, and it was sent to him by the 17th of May by an unknown person involved in the Soviet. A handwritten note on the bottom of this notice informs O'Brien that one Kennedy, a clerk at the company who had, to quote the note, always pretended to be our friend, had been seen putting these up around the area. The writer calls attention to the fact that notices make no reference to workers or miners and states that Kennedy had been unable to find anyone willing to put these up for him. The note further then lists several individuals in around the area around Leitrim who are helping the miners to sell coal. The implication being that the Soviet feels like the public feeling is behind them. So the miners operated one of the pits themselves. Uh, a newspaper report seems to imply that some of that coal was sold to Sligo Corporation. And we have to remember at this point there's strikes going on in Britain in coal mines there, so it's very hard to import coal. People are desperate for it. So yeah, it's interesting to wonder that if other corporations and institutional clients were forced to buy coal from the Soviet. And it's even interesting to wonder if the Cavan and Leitrim Railway Company was, although I need further research to say that definitively. <coughs> 
Coal was sold locally and improvements were undertaken by the miners. At this point, Reverend Diggs was the company's chairman and through his solicitor, he threatened to seek a high court injunction against the miners, which would include suing them for coal and for any damages done to the machinery. Having personally inspected myself the invoices of the ITGWU solicitors during this period, it does not appear that they were notified of any legal correspondence from Reverend Diggs or from the company. So that would seem to imply that the company basically did not contact them and instead were probably looking for another method to resolve the situation. So I just want to ask what I think is an important question, which is why in Arigna? Why was this possible in Arigna as a result of this dispute over reprivatization? but not in South Wales or in Scotland. And I mean, an obvious factor is the ongoing war that was going on in the country. Now, while in Britain, unions were often relatively timid because they did not want to appear to be jeopardizing the national effort to recover from the First World War, in Ireland, the unions understood themselves to essentially be in a state of conflict with the government. The mining company, with its history of local unpopularity and its aristocratic unionist owners, was in many ways an ideal case for a political Soviet. It is also worth considering the role that the war may have had in radicalizing the miners themselves. Arigna had been among the first areas in Roscommon to host a Sinn Féin branch, and during the war, Crown forces seemed to have perceived it as a Republican stronghold. For example, in the aftermath of the Four Mile House ambush in October of 1920, the miners at Arigna were subjected to a violent search and interrogation at their workplace by the British military. Again, in the aftermath of the Scramo ambush on the 23rd of March of 1921, which is exactly the time that this dispute of pay is, over pay is breaking out, the Arigna area was subjected to a major search operation, during which the Crown forces reportedly kidnapped a 70-year-old man. These sort of events must have had an effect on the attitude of the miners. In a more general way, the troops and police could not be sent in against the miners in Arigna as they had been in, for example, Glasgow in 1919, or Tony Pandy in Wales in 1911, because they were otherwise occupied fighting the IRA and were later observing a truce. The RIC in Roscommon was already heavily limited in its ability to operate outside of towns by 1921, and British Army troops reportedly struggled to operate in the mountainous terrain in the area around Arigna, which was part of why they resorted to raiding and kidnapping tactics. It is unsurprising, therefore, that they were not sent in to recover the mines, as they would likely have met stiff opposition, not only perhaps from local IRA fighters, but also from the 130 or so miners believed to be involved. <coughs> it is also important to note that the precedent set by other Soviets in recent years in Ireland made such an action conceivable to those involved. It had moved the window of what was possible in Ireland. By 1921, a workers' Soviet was simply seen as another option available to workers in a dispute, and in fact, they were relatively common. This phenomenon is not mirrored in any way in Britain. Moving along, we come to the end of the Soviet. So the mine, having been operated by the Soviet through May and June, in July, the company reopened negotiations. According to reports in the Freeman's Journal, it was agreed that the old wage of 10 shillings per tonne of coal would be retained, and furthermore, that wages between the old and new pits would be equalized, which actually amounted to a raise for some workers. The workers were reported to have secured the payment of insurance benefits for the period of the Soviet, the employment of only union men going forward, and that all contracts made with customers by them would be honored at the agreed prices. The miners also secured, kind of remarkably, reportedly secured compensation for improvements affected by them on the mines while they were in control, which is kind of mad to think. They are quoted as stating that they would remain in occupation of the mine if their demands were not satisfied. And the company essentially seems to have, at this point, rolled over and given up, implying that they simply saw no other way to resolve the situation. Now, we might surmise that this is probably related to the disturbed state of the country at this time. In 1922, Reports in unionist-leaning papers in Sligo and Scotland came out based on a report written for the company, for the Arigna Mining Company. Now, while this report acknowledges that work had ceased in March, and then it then skips over the entire summer and says nothing about that, and states that an agreement was released, reached on the 4th of July. They claim that this agreement included a provision that stated that if the price of coal continued to fall, the miners would, to quote it, meet the owners on the question of wages. Wage cuts of 10%, this is according to the report, were announced again on the 29th of August, and the men again refused to accept them. Further pay cuts were announced by the company in September, and on the 21st of September, the company states that the miners struck work and occupied the mines again 
A further conference was held in October and again in November. Now, throughout this period, the mining company's report states that raiding continued, by which they presumably mean the selling of coal by miners, but it's hard to differentiate whether this might also refer to raids by Republican forces. At this point, in general, it becomes difficult to parse the difference between the activities of the miners and events related to the escalating civil war. In a letter published in the Irish Independent in October of 1921, Reverend Diggs states, stated that the mines have been closed. In September of that year, a representative of the Tum Electricity Company stated that they had endeavoured to secure coal from Arigna, but the miners have been unable to supply this. The Freeman's Journal also reported the mines to be closed down currently on the 27th of October. So it seems like after the summer, there's a period where the, mines, the mining company isn't in control, the miners aren't working the mines. It's ambiguous, really, what exactly is happening at this point. On the 3rd of February of 1922, a conference was called by the Ministry of Labour. According to a later letter sent by Diggs, Republican forces had occupied the mines in late 1921 and begun dismantling equipment in order to make landmines. In July of 1922, large numbers of anti-treaty IRA forces retreated <coughs> into the Arigna area, having been driven from strongholds in North Roscommon. And from this point on, the area seems to have been largely under their control up until 1923. On the 14th of August, 1922, pro-treaty forces attacked the mines, which had been described, it is claimed, had become a kind of anti-treaty camp, reportedly including an actual functioning field hospital with nurses in one of the mine buildings. The Free State troops, whatever they were there for, caused major damage, including bombing and ultimately flooding one of the mine shafts, basically disabling it. As a result, it appears that the mines were not operational really from this point on for many years, and it does not appear to have recovered until later under the control of the Leyden family. In 1924, the mining company's Siamese twin, the CNL, was incorporated into the Great Southern Railways, leaving the Arigna Mining Company as something of a stub and it was eventually wound down in 1929. So just briefly to talk about uh, some of the conclusions we might reach from this story. We must understand the Soviet and the context that followed it, which cry out for further research, in the context of the civil war in Leitrim under Skomen, and in the manner in which physical force was employed in the pursuit of personal, social, and professional grievances. Patrick Flanagan, uh, the author of the most famous history of the CNL, tells us that in 1921, for example, there were a string of kidnappings of employees and directors of the railway company related to the allegedly unfair dismissal of several employees, which despite the intervention of free state troops on the company's behalf, eventually led to their reinstatement. At one point, even the famous Reverend Diggs himself was briefly made a prisoner, but only for a few hours. Equally, during the early part of the civil war in Roscommon, anti-treaty forces involved themselves in land agitation quite frequently, tensions over land having been a particularly important element in the conflict in that country, which is as opposed to Leitrim where it played a smaller role. <coughs> All of this could be described as a form of social banditry, as, which is the phrase used by Patrick McGarty in his book on the subject, uh, and it's taken from Eric Hobsbawm. So this refers to the kind of Robin Hood aspect of what was being done. And it would tend to agree with the assertion that the Arigna Collins actions were seen by some, at least in the area, as a form of social banditry, as a way of breaking the law in order to settle grievances or to correct something that was unfair about the current system. It is also worth drawing attention to this specific class, and as I said, you might say ethno-religious character of these disputes, which is namely that virtually the entirety of the directors of both companies were either members of the local aristocratic gentry or Ulster Presbyterians brought in for their expertise. And for example, the railway company's chairmen were in order the Earl of Kingston, Colonel H.G. Clements of this family, and then a Mr. S.B. Rowe. As in the case of the unfortunate Captain Cox, the man who was killed back in the flattery times, we can see that often the cultural divisions between the management and the men could lead to acrimony rooted in the not entirely unreasonable feeling locally that the owners of the company held the local majority in contempt to some degree or another. Decisions made by the company, such as their reconfiguration of the board in order to lock out the influence of the elected councils, and their decision at one point to put on a special train for orange men heading to the 12th, even when such trains were specifically against company policy, contributed to these feelings locally and ultimately likely contributed to the breakdown in trust and communication between the managers and the workers and the local community more broadly. 
From the company's perspective, the story remains one of unfulfilled promise, just like every other company before it. While it may have been easy for the directors to blame local prejudice, as Diggs referred to, or the attitude of labor, as the report of 1922 referred to, the fact remained that the company had never lived up to what had been promised to shareholders and to local ratepayers. Now, the reasons for this are manifold and cannot be boiled simply down to either labor problems or mismanagement. The underdevelopment of the region's transportation system certainly in, uh, had an impact because it locked the coal out of national and international markets. The necessity of competing with artificially cheap coal from Britain, the lack of any long-term coordinated development plan for the region, and the political complexities of the piecemeal system of London land grants and loans that was available, the lack of local capital and the general poverty of most people that essentially made it difficult to extract significant amounts of money, all of these factors interacted with the political, class-based and ethno-religious tensions within the area to contribute to the company's troubles and to eventually make possible the extraordinary action taken by the workers. So finally, I want to ask the question of whether ultimately this was a Pyrrhic victory for the miners and for labour more broadly. You know, in the end, even though they got their concessions, the mine, as far as we can tell, didn't work very much for the rest of the decade, and it's unclear how many of them were able to work for the rest of the decade. In some ways, the story of the Soviet and its ending can be seen as a microcosm for the fate of the radical labour movement in Ireland more generally, in the sense that it was both made possible by, but was eventually overtaken by the contemporary struggle for national liberation, in this case by specifically the Civil War. Now, unlike the workers in Limerick, the strikers in Arigla do not seem to have had a specifically political goal in their actions, and they were not exactly protesting against the British state, but we can see that their actions still took place within a context of political, nationalist, unionist tensions. In a more literal sense, if it had not been for the act of conflict raging in the area at the time, we might reasonably assume that security forces and or the Royal Irish Constabulary would have quickly been sent in to eject the miners from their occupation. The conflict made what happened possible, and more broadly, it enabled the sequence of Irish Soviets of which it was a part to occur. It directly introduced the idea of the Soviet into the realm of what was thought possible within Irish labour disputes. But at the same time, eventually, the war overtook the miners and the company. And while further research is needed to understand exactly what happened during the period of anti-treaty occupation, which is to say, was the mine actually worked by the anti-treaty forces? We don't really know that yet. It seems clear that the damage wrought in 1922 rendered the mine unworkable for much of the remainder of the decade, essentially making the initial victory of the miners a pyrrhic one. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I haven't gone too long. Thank you.